Due to the following CBS School Break special, Magnum P.I. will not be seen today. It will be broadcast tomorrow in the regular time period. Word Balloon is brought to you by the League of Word Balloon Listeners. This episode of Word Balloon is brought to you by AlexRossArt.com. Alex is a brand new graphic novel coming out from Marvel and Abrams Books. Fantastic Four, Full Circle. It comes out September 6th. It's a rainy night in Manhattan, and not a creature is stirring except for the thing, Ben Grimm. When an intruder suddenly appears inside the Baxter building, the Fantastic Four find themselves surrounded by a swarm of invading parasites. These carrion creatures, composed of negative energy, come to Earth using a human host as a delivery system. But for what purpose? And who is behind this untimely invasion? The Fantastic Four have no choice but to journey to the Negative Zone, an alien universe comprised entirely of antimatter, risking not just their own lives, but the fate of the cosmos. Fantastic Four Full Circle is the first long-form work written and illustrated by acclaimed artist Alex Ross, who revisits a classic Lee Kirby story from the 60s and introduces the storyline for a new generation of readers. Bold, vivid colors, his trademark visual storytelling, Ross takes Marvel's first team of superheroes to places only he can illustrate. The book also features a special poster jacket with the front flap unfolding to reveal an all-new fully painted origin story of the Fantastic Four. Again, Fantastic Four, full circle, out September 6th. For more details, go to alexrossart.com. Welcome back, everybody. Time again for uh, Word Balloon's presentation of Scene Missing, the Kinescope crew talking about movies. Uh, we, should we come up with a name for this thing at some point? I mean, back, no, like, back in the back in the day, we had Scene Missing for our my movie. Uh, that's true, and it's particularly uh, ironic considering we only cover uh, uh, people dying. You know, like it, <laughs> it feels like uh, a little ironic. I don't. Know. I mean, I, I, I feel like we should come up with a more death oriented name. I mean, if 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 we were in poor taste, we would call this Angela's Ashes, but we're not in poor taste. So we wouldn't <laughs> and I, as as I, both Angela Lansbury and I both have Irish citizenship through parentage, and I consider her a national treasure. I would never say that, but if if we were of more, uh, less tasteful... We, Ian, what. you just said it, okay? Don't <laughs> just take responsibility. You know what? <laughs> The, the too bad this is live and we can't uh, go rewind it. What I'm was your uh, what was your one that we started that you told us right before? That, we it started? looks like we killed her with that grave you. And so I said, it looks like murder we did. <laughs> murder we did. <laughs> Absolutely, man. Yeah. Too goddamn funny. Well, uh, yes, we are uh, paying tribute. There she is, mean as hell. It's her best villain role, uh, but not as not a stranger to real villain roles. I mean, you know, she's the uh ingenue that uh charles boyer uh, wants to get down with in uh gaslight, gaslight. back in the day mm -hmm. and i'm gonna during the course of this i'm gonna pull up a couple uh young angela lansbury pictures she i mean listen she's everybody's favorite grandmother in murder she wrote bed knobs and broomsticks all the all the fun stuff she did as an old young at bed knobs and broomsticks though <laughs> Well, younger, yeah, younger. Yeah. I agree with that. Younger older than she was, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, probably, and and younger than she was in that Turing candidate. But you go back to the forties, hubba hubba, man, she, she was lovely. I mean, she always was, but I mean, she was quite a stunner when she was a young woman. I don't think, I, apart from uh, Gaslight, is what you said. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know that I've seen a ton of her. really. Uh, uh, he's in Lansbury. Dorian oh, Gray, right? Is it? Yeah. Oh, sure, Dorian Gray. Yes, mm -hmm. and yeah. also uh, a, a a lesser Frank Capra movie, but still an interesting movie. State of the Union. Okay. Yeah, yeah. She's the other woman, and and uh, it's a Spencer Tracy Hepburn right. movie. Right. Yeah, I have seen and, that one. That's right. And she's great in that, and she's she she's a knockout in that as well. But uh, yeah, I, I mean, really, let's let's face it, guys. I mean, Manchurian Candidate is such a great movie. Yeah, um, yeah. I I'm I'm really 
I got to say, I'm bad at the Angela Lansbury because I've literally never seen an episode of Murder, She Wrote. I know this is yeah. terrible, but <laughs> like, yeah. but, you know, I like, so the, the main pop culture thing that people know her for, I don't know a thing about, but the, but I do, you know, I am a fan of this movie. Uh, I don't, I've had a, you know, and, and my, my feelings on this movie have evolved over time, but, uh, you know, but like, uh, do you want to get into it? Do you want to tell people uh, what this thing is? John? Sure. Ian, absolutely. Someone? Uh, well, yeah, we will. Uh, absolutely. This is the story of uh, of Raymond Shaw, who was a uh, serviceman during the Korean War. And um, I'm going to get the uh, the great picture of him as he's being uh, decorated and stuff. Uh, oh, I'm getting it out of sequence. Stand by. That's Stand right. by. Where is this is it? literally photographed off my TV. Yeah, I understand. That's all right, man. Yeah. Here, come on. Did I do the same thing? I did the same thing. Yeah, the guy's like, "How do you feel?" That's, that's the second one. It's it's fine. Yeah, but it's it's a great line, and uh, I didn't remember this line. And uh, you know, Ian points out that uh, Raymond Shaw makes that comparison both in the book and in the film that he feels like Captain Idiot. And uh, that's uh, what's the name of that comic creator that uh, did Captain Idiot? Isn't that the guy that? I didn't know that was a real. There, I don't think that's a real yeah. thing. I, I mean, oh, it's a, uh, I thought it was just like know. a joke. You like, like, yeah, a fake uh, superhero. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I think so. I don't know okay. if it's a real thing. I well, mean, we're, go on. Oh, maybe. Well, no, I don't. I don't know. Maybe you're thinking of Fletcher Hanks or somebody. Somebody. That's that, that is stuff, exactly right? who, uh, who I was thinking of. Was but, that yeah, it was I don't. A, uh, Fletcher. I don't think it's a real character. Thing. Mm -hmm. Well, um, all right. So, so Raymond Shaw is uh, the son of uh, uh, Angela Lansbury's character, who has since remarried to uh, Senator John Island, who we see in the background there, played by James Gregory. And, uh, you know, again, it seems like this is a hero thing. He saved his platoon from uh, from being captured and in killed, uh, you know, a dozen, mm -hmm. yeah, during the Korean War, mm -hmm. killed a dozen uh, China or Korean, uh, North Korean soldiers, I forget which. But uh, actually, it's an elaborate plot that involves brainwashing. There was no real thing. This was all orchestrated. They were captured. And uh, I've got the, do I have the great pictures of them at the flower show? Uh, yeah, oh, I mean. So, so yeah, uh, we'll get, we'll get to that scene. But again, it's essentially, here's who they were captured by, uh, or the, the leader of uh, the, the group that captures them, brainwashes all of them, including uh, Lawrence Harvey, to believe that he has created this heroic deed. His his um, his major or his command? No, uh, I believe Captain. major. Captain. Yeah, yeah. Major. Thank you, Ben sure. Ben Marco. Ben Marco <laughs> played uh, played by Frank Sinatra. Uh, a great role for Frank Sinatra. Yes, um, is is the guy who vouches for him, and that's why he gets the medal. But essentially, it turns out uh, this is an elaborate brainwashing plot to make uh, Raymond Shaw an assassin for the communist government. So we can leave it there and, and continue to talk as we discuss the various I characters. I want to, to say to uh, some of our viewers who um, uh, who may be new to this film or are not that familiar, the uh, the idea of the brainwashed sleeper agent uh, is something that is oh you see it a lot in pop culture. Uh, it's certainly it, the MCU has used it quite a few bit, but certainly with the Winter Soldier character, uh, Reggie Jackson in Naked Gun, yes. uh, you see a lot. They're all getting it from Manchurian Candidate. Manchurian Candidate is what sparked this originally Richard Condon's novel and then the film by Frankenheimer written by George Axelrod. They're all getting it from this. So if, it, if, the, if that idea sounds familiar, this is where they got yeah. it. Yeah, what? but also, and, and it was at the time. I mean, th this was a thing about you know uh, about POWs in the Korean War, yeah. and that there was a, a like this this uh, like a, a slightly misunderstood idea that they could conceivably have come back brainwashed, which is maybe a little bit you know it, it was it was more like uh, you know concerned that the you know that that there was some that they uh, that. The communist I mean, government, you know, communists had gotten to them yeah. and, you know, had right. some rather than literally brainwashing them to be, you know, super. But, uh, or something. but also uh, as part of uh, the CIA's experiments in the 50s, the yeah. MK Ultra project, yes. which involved yeah. LSD. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so, yeah, I mean, this was a tactic 
that was uh, being done by uh, both sides. Yeah, They're, but it's not. It's yeah. I mean, it's something that they wanted to be able to. Yes, do. Right, right, well, right. Yeah, yeah, it's extrapolated yeah. to a heightened yes, exactly. sense of reality. Exactly. Exactly. But yeah, I mean, again, it was brainwashing. Was kind of a thing. You know, it was kind of a thing. Yeah, it was. <laughs> I want to right? well, give yeah. you a, a quote um, from this is from a, a UN commander, General Mark W. Clark. Uh, great name. Um, <laughs> Mark Clark. Uh, Mark he was Clark. talking about. Um, Korean uh, American Korean POWs uh, who said they shouldn't be blamed. Um, their actions were due to communism's mind annihilating methods. And using the term mind annihilating, I think is what um, set uh, uh, sparked a lot of imaginations. Mm -hmm. But this is an all star cast. Uh, again, we've got, you know, Angela Lansbury and James Gregory in great supporting roles. Um, we've also got Janet Lee. Mm -hmm. And uh, and uh, she's she, it's interesting. I mean, uh, you know, I, I understand why she's there, but man, that is uh, okay. that is your definition. Okay. As Kelly Kelly Sudaconic would say, your sexy lamp. Okay, uh, yeah, she, this is actually a big interesting thing to take apart. I think in this movie, though, like please. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I don't know if it's worth getting to first, but the but. I, you know, when I first saw this movie, uh, and I don't know, maybe we could go around the horn here and talk about when you were first exposed to the movie. But like, I first saw it, you know, in 88, when there was the big, you know, uh, you know, I was uh, like 14 or something, and the movie was re-released finally. And, uh, you know, and when I was a kid, I took this, you know, took this movie a little more like straightforwardly than I think that the movie intends even. It's a, it, it's a very heightened movie in a lot of ways, right? Oh. And, uh like no, it is. I mean, I believe it is, right? Well, I mean, I, 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 I don't it, think it, they were. Go ahead, Gabe, and then I'll I'll make my. We comment. could we could talk about intent all day long, but I'm saying like it plays as a heightened movie even compared to other movies at the time, and well, the um the but like her character when I and I you know and I I enjoyed the movie I liked it and everything I saw it again and you know 10, 15 years later or whatever and thought what the hell is with her character? Like, you know, it felt, the movie felt more shallow to me. I wasn't quite, I, I think I, I had an idea in my head of what it was that wasn't exactly what the real movie is, you know, because of watching it as a kid. And, uh, you know, and particularly her character stood out to me as like, what, why is this character in the movie? I mean, we can say, hey, you know, it, you, it makes sense why she's there, but I'm not entirely sure it does. Uh, but, just let me finish my my thought, John. Please. Did I say anything? And Shut up. You raised yeah. your hand. Well, I'm saying um, the, it's the, the um. So like I, uh, but watching it this time, I think there is something deeply strange going on with this character. Whether it's really the intent or not the intent, I don't know. But it's but the fact that like. If you listen to the dialogue in their scene, oh, their yeah. first scene together, it's surreal. It doesn't, it plays like she literally, she brings up China. It's like there's a, she you know. She says she's Chinese. <laughs> yes, exactly. Like it's, it's as if she is, you know, some sort of operative controller type person. Yet this doesn't exactly, this doesn't pay off in the course of the movie. No. It's highly suggested no one in researching it. It's, I mean, I didn't. I don't know the novel, but like in researching it, it seems like where where you know, was there was this the intent at some point? It was cut out. Nobody says anything like that, mm -hmm. you know. And um, so I, I just find it a very interesting, ambiguous thing. No matter what their original intent was with her. Well, in the infamous scene where uh, Raymond is once again under her spell, and she is giving. Her direct orders to Raymond. This is at the costume party, uh, and and she says, "I have taken steps to oh, no, no. get them." Well, let me finish, Gabe. Like, that I'm talking about steps. a different thing that I was talking about. But well, all right, then I don't understand because then I don't understand your point because she explains, as I understand it, that she is manipulating yeah, them oh, after the fact. Right. I'm talking about to... the Jan Lee character. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> yeah, okay. not. Not the mom, okay. right? Okay, but there is a theory uh, that on the, the train she talk is about Janet Lee. maybe trying to unlock some coding in Marco and Sinatra's yes. character that she's saying phrases to try and trigger something. You're right, but it never pays off. It never is stated that anything happened. But it's no. almost more interesting that it doesn't. But it's I don't know how you would 
approach it that way if it mm -hmm. you know if it wasn't kind of intended to suggest something it's such a you know i mean certainly you know i mean yeah it's i, it's, I, it's it's just, I just find it very odd and ambiguous and i found that to be an incredibly interesting part of the movie watching yeah. it this time uh, people but, who haven't seen know. this scene they you, we can't even begin to describe how strange the dialogue is in this mm -hmm. scene. It's, yeah. it's, it's word like jazz. nothing else than any other movie yeah. ever filmed. Really, yeah. it's yeah, it's word jazz. No, excuse me, Gabe. I didn't realize that's what you, that's what you meant. But yeah, it's uh, it is. It's it's very odd, and her motivations are odd. Uh, no, the whole thing. And she and like waves her fiance or her boyfriend. To yeah, she, has, like she says that. like yeah. She's, she says she she says like oh, I said I wasn't married, and say I wasn't engaged. Right. So, so there, although, there is some skullduggery. Yeah. And although I'm not sure we see do we ever see her in a scene without, without with anybody Sinatra. besides no. Frank Sinatra? No. No. I don't know. So I mean yeah, she like, might be a Tyler Durden for all we know. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. It could be a delusion. You're right about it. You know, that. I mean it, maybe good. it is some kind of programmed mm -hmm. in thing. I don't, know. I don't know. We don't I don't know what their intent was, but we have every ability to go and read it however it actually plays. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I don't know. I have to confess, and I'm sure someone in the comments will bring up the Denzel movie to compare. Is there a character that is comparable? Yes. To yeah, Janet they, fix, they fix that problem. I actually like the it's Demi movie. Um, it's not as good as this, but I do think it works on its, on its own. It, it just plays up the paranoia aspect throughout. Yeah. Um, but in the movie, uh, she's she is revealed to be – well, she's revealed to be an FBI agent – and is and is uh, handling uh, Marco, who's played by Denzel Washington in the 2004 sure. film. So right. they do fix, and also they combine certain characters in the remake, and so she has a bigger role in the ending. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I I think that the in a way that's almost a problem for me in the remake, which I actually think is okay, and I, I don't mm -hmm. think that this movie is unassailable or or unremakeable. You know, I mean, it's it, the um, but like. I mean, because the the remake goes for a very different tone than the than the original film does, yeah. and the way that the um, but I'm not sure that it does itself any favors by fixing that thing, considering how un like lacking credibility her her introduction to him is, you know, and and that sort of stuff. But I don't know. Uh, anyway, let's go on to talk about the bigger bulk of of everything. Sure. And all that. You know. So you know, yeah, Lawrence Harvey. I mean, Lawrence Harvey. It's it's uh, shown right away that he is just a snot of a man, and oh, yeah. uh, and mm -hmm. his and his platoon uh, really doesn't care for him. Um, you know, nobody does. Uh, certainly, even although they've all been programmed to say Raymond Shaw is the kindest, warmest man you know we ever you know served with, but uh, yes, yeah, uh, Sinatra is just so great in this, and it is so classically fifties Frank. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, he's just. How you doing, Busta? You know, the, the whole schmear. But uh, you do, you appreciate him. All of these platoon men, including um, uh, Lawrence Harvey, Raymond Shaw, are having these weird dreams, and they can't they can't figure them out. And essentially, these these dreams start with them at this uh, New Jersey floral show and uh, seem to be bored out of their minds when in actuality uh, it's a brainwash uh, a cover of what was really happening, and that was – a demonstration of the brainwashing in front of uh, Chinese and Russian nationalists uh, led by, and, and uh, shame on me, what's his the actor's name here? Oh, I don't know. No, he's I don't, Hawaii Five-0. Yeah, but... Right. Yeah, uh, it's, Wolf, it's Wolf Fat from Hawaii Five-0. I'll get to him. Hold on. Because uh, it'll be, it, sh it should be right here. It's, oh, uh, amazing. K there he is. Kai Dei, I don't know. I'm yeah, sure Kai Dei. Kai, Kai let's Day, say okay. Kai Dei, I believe. Uh, who plays uh, Dr. Yen Lo, and as we just said, uh, infamous for his role in uh, Hawaii Five O as one of the recurring uh, villains, Wu Fat, and a tremendous actor, excellent, and, and a really distinct performance in this too. Like yeah. uh, you know his voice and the way he carries himself. And and also, he's, he's he so seems like a great guy. Yes, you know, yeah, aside from well, murder and stuff, he plays yeah. it real light. You know, like he yes. doesn't, yeah. But that's but that's his his demeanor, and and really in this era, we're sadly. Uh, stereotypes were still happening in films. He he is really this very dignified actor, and in all of his characterizations that I've ever seen, just purports himself as this very dignified, you know, straight up guy who is scary. Yeah, he's, a, and, he's an yeah. Asian Sydney Green Street. Yeah, his yeah, character. And his, and, 
Go ahead. Makes it out of the movie unscathed, as far as we know. He's mm -hmm. he's fine at the end. <laughs> yeah, they like really they they don't. We, there are no big repercussions for anybody behind the scenes of this stuff, no. which is actually kind of good in a lot of ways because it's well, you know I mean it, it would be too easy to to tie it up right. that much. Except for the except for the, the except for those who don't survive till the end of the movie. Exactly, sure. yeah. or survive oh, till yeah, the yeah. very end of the movie. And yeah, the... <laughs> right. yeah, and that and really that's another thing. For 1962, this is a very raw movie, and yeah, I yes. love that. Oh yes, yeah. And yeah. it's uh, really, it's it's really impressive. And it it man, it's disappointing to hear you. And you said you you were reading the book, and it's not very good. Oh well, here's the thing. Well, I was not expecting the book to be so horny, and <laughs> it is, and that's a bad thing. <laughs> it, it's almost because it's basically taking the plot of Manchurian Candidate and adding, uh, you know, uh, just a bunch of like smutty short stories. If that's what, if that's what your idea of improving the Manchurian Candidate run out and buy the novel because you got a, a whole situation. You got a long extended scene of a flashback of James Gregory's character, in World War II and his attempts to uh, have sex with Inuit women. Like, that's a okay, long... And yeah. I'm like, why am I dealing with that? Wow. I mean, you might not need that. Yeah. yeah. Wow. <laughs> um, it is, it's interesting because, like the Ian Fleming Bond novels, this is one of those JFK novels that he adored. And yeah, when... Read it. Sinatra and talked about it with JFK. Yeah, yeah. The story, yeah, the story is when Sinatra told him that he had optioned the book, immediately JFK's like, who's uh, going to play the mother? You know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you know who's not for wanted to play. Them? Oh, I know. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Will. It's... He wanted Will. Lucille Ball. Yeah, Lucille Ball. Yeah. She yeah. would have been amazing. She would have been amazing. I th honestly, man, uh, Orson Welles himself wanted to make serious dramas with Lucy. Well, you know, very early in her RKO years, and everyone's like, "Are you nuts? She's a bit player. She's nobody." So yeah. I, I could absolutely see Lucy in this role. I would like to. See I'd like to see it for curiosity's sake, but it's hard to see her topping Angela Lansbury. Yeah, because yeah, and oh, no, Angela no, no. Lansbury <laughs> is incredibly good in this. And, Absolutely. You know, uh, um, although I, I gotta say, what's her accent? What's the deal with her? That is one of my favorite things about the movie. <laughs> is both Angela Lansbury and Lawrence Harvey don't change their accent, and yeah. no one says or, anything. Although I swear, in scene one, she kind of sounds like she has some sort of southern accent or something like that, and then that just kind of goes away. I'm not entirely sure what it is, but uh, uh, but it is funny to not, you know, like. I mean, I think we're just also used to watching this movie that we're not really thinking of the fact that these are American, whatever, you know, right. like, it, it, you know, you know, it's, it, it's, but it is part of the kind of oddness of this movie too. Like, yeah. and it is an odd movie. Like it's, it's not, uh, um, you know, all of the, uh, and in some ways kind of over the top about things. And in some ways kind of like, uh, you know, I mean the, the central conceit, the, the brainwashing stuff and the way that the dream is presented with the with the big ridiculous like um, photos of Mao and Stalin behind them and stuff, you know, <laughs> yeah. like it's broad, you know. I mean, but at the same time, it's playing a lot of a lot of other stuff very straight. Certainly, everything with Frank is played very straight, mm -hmm. and then the stuff with Angela Lansbury is very heightened, you know. And mm -hmm. uh, these tones, these odd tones coming together, I think, are something that makes the movie kind of work in a weird way. Like, uh, and then you know, you you go along, and then by the you know by the last act of it, it's you know you're you're totally drawn into this. You know oh, that okay. the bit where he you know where he kills. Um, uh, John MacGyver and his uh, and you know and and his new wife like that's it's just like brutal you know and very yeah. stylized and brutal and then everything about the ending is very very brutal and all of these tones working together I think has something to do with my, what continues to make this movie interesting and compelling. I think it might have to be with just how masterful that dream sequence comes off because I have to say like when I first saw the film I was a teenager I knew I. My mom watched Murder, She Wrote all the time, so I knew uh, Angela Lansbury is this nice old lady who worked with Tom Poston to solve murders. Right. Um, uh, and here I am, and, and so obviously this performance blew my mind. Um, but 
you know, when I when I was a teenager, like 15, if I watched a film, you know, black and white film, I, I kind of had to adjust my mind a little bit to the rhythms of older films. But I found out I didn't have to do that with this film because that uh, the the dream sequences are so surreal, but so on point. Um, and I can see the influence of Frankenheimer's work in live television. We've, we've talked about Frankenheimer before mm-hmm. uh, with, with the, the comedian, the thing he did with Mickey Rooney, uh, who's apparently the most talented. That's also uh, You can also tell that's from his live television days with uh, James Gregory and the TV there. All the monitors. In yeah. The yeah. It, it's such great. You can tell that Frankenheimer could edit in camera, which is, I'm not saying what they did in that film, but he could... He could think that way, and that is the only way that this weird back and forth going between, um, you know, New Jersey flower ladies and uh, Russian uh, KGB guys who are apparently meant to be the same people, the only way that works, and the fact that these soldiers are completely nonchalant, including when uh, Lawrence Harvey kills, uh, who I can only describe as the Bucky of the group. It's it's so crazy that... Winter Soldier became a character influenced by the Manchurian Candidate because there's like a 60 year old kid and Lawrence Harvey points the gun at the camera, great train robbery style, and and you see and then the next thing is a, a oh, yeah. shot of of the kid. It's a, it's a high up shot, which again I think is from Frank and Iver's TV days of the kid being blown away. And it, when I saw that, as like this is as vital as any modern film. When I was a kid, when I saw this, it's like. I think that grabs you, and and because it's so personal, it's happening. Their dreams, their nightmares, happening to the characters. You see Sinatra, you see uh, James Edwards as uh, uh, mm-hmm. Alan Melvin, uh, and you see Lawrence Harvey. And Lawrence Harvey is uh, particularly uh, distressed. You see that happening to them. I think that's what grabs you. Seeing seeing these characters distress. Well, and the way the dream sequence is so. I mean. We've kind of said like it switches between the 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 hyd- fun with hydrangeas meeting and then the communist you know demonstration, but it starts to blend where you have the women are in the Chinese setting and then yeah. mm-hmm. you know they hand over a kerchief, but it's the thing they strangle and in um, Alan Melvin's you know the African American soldier the women are black in his dream yeah and it's just, yes um, it's yeah. not commented uh, on but it's just his dream so that's how he. You know, it in his right. Head. Yeah. Frankenheimer said they shot it six times, uh, different ways in different variations, and and, you and know, also crazy. on a on a turntable. Yeah. Which is I, fascinating. Yeah. yeah. So they yeah, had. So then they get the three sixty thing. Yeah, yeah. They had they had the little old ladies on one side, and then you'd flip it over, and there were the there were the soldiers. And, and the going people. back to what we were saying about how all the men hate Raymond Shaw, now he hated all them. When they when they're trying to pick someone for him to strangle as a demonstration, they don't say who do you like the most. There's like. Who do you dislike the least? Because he mm-hmm. hates all of them. But <laughs> which one would you least want to kill? <laughs> also, I want to go back to because there's a great backstory of how this came back into uh, theaters and finally into uh, VHS and everything. Yes, and but I do is... want to make sure we're getting it right because this right. is something. Yeah, there's a big rumor the, about. Yeah, people get the the events right, but they don't get the timeline quite right. Feel free Ian, if okay. you get it all down. So um, we we talked. So uh, JFK was a fan of the novel, the super smutty novel. I don't know what JFK saw in this. Hey, and look, JFK you know, liked those James. JFK liked those James. That's right. He liked them. He did not have exactly. good that's taste. Fair. All right. Yeah, I think man, he the, liked, the he liked curvy we... novels. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah he said, Do you have the latest uh, hustler over there? <laughs> it's yeah, I know that's slang. anachronistic. <laughs> but also, real fast, um, uh, the because uh, because this is part of the timeline. The film came out in 62. Yeah. JFK was yeah. killed in 63. Yeah. Continue. Yeah. Right. Continue. And, and it came out like kind of at the height of the Cuban Missile Crisis, too. Yeah. Like, absolutely. You know, so, which we, so, that was, so that was a thing. Um, uh, UA was getting worried because this film, uh, I mean, it, it calls out China and Russian comments. They don't, it's, it's not like something where they pretend it's a fake, they don't do the top yeah. gun route. Where they just have or a the fake James Bond route. The, yes, true. Yeah. Yes, we're we're sure. Sure. Right. right. Um, and they're like, well, what if you know JFK is is striking a deal with the Russians, and then this movie comes out? Um, 
And then uh, Sinatra says, well, I just came to see Jack. And he says he can't wait to see the movie. So are you going to disappoint him? I don't know why Sinatra sounds like John Wayne in my impression. Baby. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, and so, and so, yeah. And, and so, you know, Sinatra, uh, Kenny was very close. Um, so the movie comes out in 1962. Uh, it does not do well is a thing, which is crazy to think. But, you know, you know and Sinatra was huge. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, and yes, and so uh, November 1963 is the assassination, um, and people think the film was taken out of circulation then. The fact is, um, Michael Schlesinger, who worked for MGM UA, wrote this letter to the Los Angeles Times. He says, by 1963, the film had been out for a year and had been kind of played out. Um, and so what happens in 1972, UA had a 10-year option, and then the re- revised reverted to... Sinatra, Axelrod, and Frankenheimer. Sinatra buys the film back in 72, and at least by 75, they said he just buries it. Uh, we don't know why. Now, we know he and Kennedy were close, and so maybe he feels that this movie about assassination, where the actor who's an assassin is play, is called Lawrence Harvey, which is a, <laughs> uh, a sad uh, uh, parallel yeah. to Lee I Harvey Oswald. Um, can't do anything about that. Uh, the film is just buried, and in 1988, then um, Sinatra has new lawyers, and uh, him and MGM make a deal, uh, and the, the film gets a big re-release on its 25th anniversary, and so the film was a lost film for a while, not a, not exactly at the time of the assassination, but later on, uh, yeah. Sinatra buries it. Well, um, I mean, it is also just like it wasn't a successful movie. Yeah, it people wasn't got very, very yeah. you know, people. It was yeah. a, it was always a like a bigger thing than we always think about that. You know, the way that people, you know, in Hollywood just want to bury things that weren't successful. Right. So that you know, I mean, it's pretty common. So if he, he literally held the rights to it, eh, maybe you know, he's not exactly the easiest guy to deal with. Maybe he was just like, yeah. no, we're not. <laughs> well, it was a flop. We're not going to. He look had a at falling it. out with Kennedy too. So I mean, yes, you know, that is also true. Yeah. But, yeah. but uh, also the sensitivity of it being an assassination attempt on. Yeah. A man oh, yeah. that's going to run for president, yeah. obviously, probably wrong home. But so, is it apocryphal that he didn't realize he owned the rights to the movie? Because I had always heard that his lawyers were going over assets, and it's like, you know, you, you do own this movie, and it's well, well, why is it sitting there? Uh, it's no, it, it well, I don't, I, wait, the way yeah. Michael Schlesinger write, uh, and, and he was in charge of the 88 release. The way he says is that UA had a, a ten-year option, and, and, and it was the project was. Tar- I don't think Sinatra it has like a production credit, but he was one of the main. Yeah, um, yeah he put up some of the money to buy. Yeah. I know to buy the rights to the book, and and, yeah. and so and so and just after that ten years, um, UA MGM. I don't know if they merged at that point. Went to I think it was Axelrod, Sinatra, and Frankenheimer all had um, ownership. Seven. And then, and then it was Sinatra who took it out. I don't know if he paid off Frankenheimer or what or what. Um, and but and then the New York Film Festival eighty in eighty seven or so they want to run it. And oh. uh, Sinatra Schlesinger said Sinatra had new lawyers by then, and they said, and they they made a deal with MGM that all parties were happy with, and 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 and. Frank and I were Axel Rod and Sinatra like did press. There's a thing on the Criterion. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's um, on YouTube as well. Yeah, yeah. Where they, they talk about making a film. Yeah. It's great. No, it's terrific. Yeah. And I mean, yeah. it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's a disarmed Sinatra. He's not yeah. puffed up with attitude. And, and again, it's, I mean, I, I understand. And you're, you know, some films don't click when they're initially released. But obviously, no. This is this is a great performance, and it, and it also was. I mean, it made a big enough impression that I mean, yes, I was a fourteen year old film nerd, but I still was. You know, it was still a movie that I sought out and saw at the time, and everybody was talking about, and yeah. it made a big impression when it was re released. In in Chicago, this was a re- released around the same time that the four Hitchcock films that had been buried for a long time were Window, Trouble with Harry, hmm. um, uh, uh, Vertigo, and I forget what the fourth one was. But uh, they, you know, they had come out around the same time. Yeah, I was man going to who see, knew too much, maybe. 
Uh, yeah, I don't remember. Yeah, I can't remember, but, but I thought that was earlier. But uh, well, you know, but, close you know, enough. But it's time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because um, I know I was in college then, and in Central Illinois, and we drove two and a half hours to go see it in downtown Chicago, mm-hmm. just because me and my uh, buddy, who was a massive old movie fan as well, were like, we got to see this. Yeah, and so yeah, yeah like mm-hmm. you know, like like farmers coming to the big city to see the movie and stuff. We went, we went and saw it. And it blew us away. And also, Siskel and Ebert absolutely glowed. They did a lot. Of, yeah. Right. right. My dad, really when when we first got our VCR in like 83 or 84, he, you know, he would show me, you know, Citizen Kane and Casablanca and uh, I forget what, you know, whatever the, you know, the classic old movies. And then he was always talking about Manchurian Candidate, but he didn't know why. He's like, I can't find it. I, I know I saw this movie when, you know, he was young. And then in 88, you know, all the publicity. So buddies and I drove up to Cleveland and saw it in the arts theater. And we were just, you know, what a great way to see this movie after hearing about it for so long from my dad. So, Absolutely. and I did I hear somewhere that MGM was going to put it out on video and then Sinatra pushed for a theatrical release or is that, that might've been it, that they probably just wanted a VHS mm-hmm. release. And he was like, no, we're going back in the theaters. Put it back out, baby. <laughs> I swing in this movie. Are you kidding me? I get this close to Janet Lee. Um, yeah, but he's also, he's also I, I, miserable for the entire yes, movie. The <laughs> is Sinatra playing a uh, neurotic character? Yeah, sure. which is Very. interesting. I mean, he's it isn't you know it's it's not certainly. I mean, for all the this is that classic era of Frank Sinatra, it's maybe a little past because it's the early '60s. But like he is, you know, he's not playing a, a, a kind mm-hmm. of that Sinatra type exactly. He's a haunted guy in a way yeah, that he, probably is a little bit more like real Sinatra. Yeah. yeah. That yeah. scene where he lists all the books that he's reading as if they're the most natural books to be reading. It's just uh-huh. like, yeah. wow. You're like, who is this weirdo who is, uh, uh, who is like, yes, I enjoy reading the ethnic preferences of the Arab people. <laughs> yeah. right. And, and then like, I forget <laughs> how to garden and yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. You know, right. Auto uh, auto repair and yeah, it's insane. <laughs> uh, I want to bring back uh, this shot of James Gregory because another thing is uh, this really is a blender of the Cold War in the best way, and Gregory is clearly channeling Joe McCarthy. Oh, of course, and yeah. and you know, and I, I love that scene. And in fact, I also watched uh, the bonus part of the DVD and Criterion release where Angela Lansbury yeah. talks about her scenes with. Gregory and she's she's the the power behind the throne. Mm-hmm. Gregory is the senator, but she's really the the puppet master and manipulator that's really making the moves. And Gregory uh, James Gregory's adult. Yeah, he doesn't know anything. He, he doesn't no, understand no. anything that's going on. And and there's that great scene where they're having breakfast and he's uh, he's pounding on the ketchup and he's like, you know, babe, I really it'd be great if I could just have a number of how many communists are in the State Department. And uh, she's looking at the ketchup bottle, and of course yeah. it's. Heinz 57. 57. And yeah, and this is that scene. There are approximately 57 communists <laughs> in the State yeah. Department. One of the talking. craziest, um, like you, you talk about it being like a blender of Cold War uh, ideas. I'm fascinated in um, the fact that this film sort of has its cake and eat it too in, in terms of communist paranoia where they are lampooning McCarthyism but then there are also the Soviets yes. are and the communists are training. They actual are, sleeper yes. agents. <laughs> yeah. Those sleeper agents are the ones who are stoking red panic. Right, 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 yes. right. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, I, I think that the, uh, I mean, I guess you can, you can read it as, uh, um, you know, that the, that they're, you know, they're going after that kind of blustery right wing thing while say also saying that people, you know, people who are too, you know, uh, uh, you know, who are still hanging on to the idea of Stalin or whatever on the left are, you know, are naive. You know, I mean, I, I don't I'm not entirely sure if, the, you know, if how um, like one to one real world, the politics of yeah, this the movie politics. are coherent. I mean, it's, are coherent, it's a comedy but, on a lot of know, levels. It, it is, is, yeah, it's a satire. I mean, it, 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 yeah. the novel you definitely get the. I I can only hope it's it's meant to be comedic in, in a lot of ways. <laughs> <laughs> One weird thing about the politics. Okay, did you guys notice this? 
So John, so John MacGyver, uh, is it MacGyver or MacGyver? John MacGyver. MacGyver. Yeah, yeah. MacGyver. It, yeah. yeah, it is. Yeah. Uh, who uh, was also in Johnny Cool, the Henry yes. Silva yep. uh, movie. <laughs> he's the guy, he's in that Twilight Zone episode where everything's like super loud. And right. like, have you ever seen that? And he's um, in Midnight Cowboy. He's the Joe mm-hmm. Buck. Yes. Joe yeah. Buck. Yes. That's <laughs> the connection. Joe Buck. <laughs> That's the connection between the two missionary candidates because John Voight. Uh, is in the 2004 one playing a very liberal senator. Uh, yes, and that's said, actually strange. He says the that. internet is full of kooks in that, and I'm like, oh, if only he knew <laughs> what was coming. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, John McGiver and um, uh, let me get Leslie Parrish, who Leslie I believe Parrish. is the Come only on. uh, actor from the main cast who is still with us. Um, I didn't know she was still alive. That's amazing. She's still, she's still with us, hopefully. Wow. Uh, I mean, we'll see how. You know, yeah. by the time we get to the See, end of it, uh, well, we'll uh, have to do another episode on the so, adventure. So, <laughs> Leslie Parrish, let me tell you, wow. Uh, yeah, and so there's a whole thing where um, Thomas Jordan, MacGyver's character, who's also a senator, had to like sue uh, Angela Lansbury. Angela Lansbury is named her character's named Eleanor, but mostly people just call her Raymond's mom. Raymond's mom, <laughs> absolutely. And so it's like. I had to sue her because she called me a communist and then I gave all the winnings to the ACLU. And then you find out later when she goes like, don't block my uh, husband at the convention. They're part of the They're same the political same party. party. Yeah, I know. Like, what yeah. is this party right. that has well, both these guys in it? And I'm thinking he's, I mean, well, it's got to be the Republican Party because all the Lincoln in it, right? Yes, or, I mean, they're absolutely he's constantly with the Lincoln, right? Uh, yeah. He dressed as Lincoln at that one point during the the kind of the, party. The cake the, that's or the what is it? Cake or caviar or something the, that's Lincoln right. that they scoop into. Yeah, and, yep. I think, yeah, and like, uh, but uh, I mean, I guess that the idea here is that like it's it was more of there was more of a sense that it, there was a big tent, mm-hmm. you know, party a on really both sides tent. in the '60s. There were still you know, racist Dixiecrats and, right. you know, and then yeah. people farther on the left and the Republican side, there's, you know, uh, Rockefeller, whoever is like, you know, is, is more of a left leaning, you know, right. I, don't, I don't know, no, you know, with right. it. And then, so they're, bro- I, I think that it was, it wasn't maybe quite as crazy as it seems to us now that people would have broader spectrums in the, you know, within the, you know, the two parties. No region, region spoke to politics as much as, party affiliation and also i wonder because i remember rod serling talking about his teleplay for the arena and even though this was television rather than film there might have been that feeling of well let's not uh specifically let's let's make it the same party in that uh, there are different factions and not to uh offend yeah it does jumble it up well i mean it, it does jumble it up a little bit that he specifically says that the you know that um that the uh, publisher that he's going to go work for at the beginning is a Republican, which makes, it does make you go, well, then just tell us what the other people are, you know, but Mm. uh, like, um, but (laughs) there's, there are a lot of things in this movie though, that are kind of odd to me. I believe that there are a lot of things that are odd dead ends that were stylistically and stuff like there is a, a, a voiceover at the beginning of the movie for like, you know, that comes back a yeah. couple of times, says yeah. a lot of stuff that we don't need Paul to know. Freeze? It is Paul Freeze. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Paul and, Freeze. you yes. know, and like, uh, and like, I don't think you need that in there at all. The, in the remake ends up like having Denzel Washington do like a little presentation to Cub yeah. Scouts or what Boy Scouts or whatever that says all that same shit that's in the voiceover. I'm like, why do we need to know all these details of the Medal of Honor enough to have have a voiceover stuck in there at the beginning that never comes back again? But this this was still or the end of the newsreel era. And I also kind of got, I understand, it's a movie. I'm it's a just fiction. saying that I, that I could see it being this narrative exposition they felt was necessary to frame the movie. It didn't bother me. It's like, just not it, how it, drama works, you know? Like, you just, you build it into a scene or something. At least they they figured it out on the other one, even though I don't think you need that information. Well, isn't but, it, uh, but it's that, and there there are just, you know, the Janet Lee character, so, The there are just odd things in it that, that don't, you know, that are stylistically off kilter. All the <laughs> romance flashbacks between Raymond and Joe, Josie, that's Josie. Josie goes on for a while, and it, you know, yes. 
What does she keep saying? Lovable? Is that the word they keep saying? Yes, yeah, lovable. lovable. I, says, love, I am not lovable. Some people are lovable. Some people <laughs> are not lovable. But I'm not she... lovable. And, and like Sinatra's going to say, he's like, no, I know I'm not lovable. And then he goes like, but those were good times. I was lovable. <laughs> Jocelyn was lovable. You know, this character was lovable. It's, it's, I'm like, at some point, like when you hear a word yeah. too many times, the word sounds yeah. ridiculous. It's like, but it's also one it. of those kind of playwrighty things, you know, yeah. like yeah. Uh, the repetition but, of something, and you know, like. But I also say this. I adore Lawrence Harvey in this movie. I mean, he yeah, really. No, he's great. Oh, yeah. he's great. I, I can't imagine he's it. I mean, I know Lee Schreiber is in the remake, but as far as contemporaries, maybe Monty Cliff, maybe. Maybe, but maybe, maybe. in all that lovable stuff, as corny as it is, it makes that moment when he just, without a thought, turns around and shoots her. It's a shocking moment. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Well, shooting the dad it, is pretty shocking, but mm -hmm. shooting her is really it's shocking. Very shocking, and it's also it also works better because you know we we he's this this incredibly unpleasant guy. Then we get a little bit of humanity from you know from him dealing with Sinatra, and then. There's that moment where they come back after eloping, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, and he and you have this light moment with right. him that all of a sudden it gets, man, yeah, right. it gets you on board. He makes a bad joke. He, you know, uh, and like he gaucho feels, marks. Yeah. yeah the gaucho <laughs> marks. He he's he, he like he <laughs> is able to pull just the performance is able to pull off us mm -hmm. like buying him as a as a human being all of a sudden. And that that really makes killing them start. You know, yeah. I mean, that, well, the, the changes in tone that way. You know? And the brainwashing again. I mean, you just, you buy this. You really, as, as ludicrous as it gets, like when he's in the bar and, uh, the, you know, they're playing solitaire and all of a sudden the guy goes, you know, why don't you uh, take a jump in the lake? And then mm -hmm. cut to Raymond yeah, Gullman right. jumping right. in the lake. Yeah, right. I mean, it's, uh, the bar is uh, Jilly's, I believe. That's uh, right. Oh, right? that's right. Yes, yes. 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 Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. Yep. So buddy. Is, yeah, yeah, Sinatra's buddy. Yes, so. main man. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, his body man essentially. Speaking of of, yes. of handlers, managers. So uh, there's an actor in this film, Joe Adams, um, who plays like a psychiatrist, like a top government psychiatrist mm -hmm. that Sinatra works with. Uh, and I noticed, like, oh, it's it's pretty progressive that they had a, a black actor play a, a such a, a prominent role. And then I go to IMDb. I'm like, what? What else does this actor do? Joe Adams, and and uh, he's in he is in um, uh, Carmen, um, but he didn't do much. The reason why is he was Ray Charles' manager. Oh, really? So <laughs> that took him away from acting. <laughs> he's good though. He's, he's good. good in it. Yeah, he's natural, great. and he and Sinatra yeah. have some great interaction. Yeah, yeah. James Edwards is great. Um, I forget the guy's name, and, and in fact, Frankenheimer even said. The guy that plays Sinatra's commander, who you know is is his kind of emotional security blanket, and like mm -hmm. Ben, you need a break. I'm going to assign you to the Senate. You'll assist this one. Senator. I believe that's Douglas Henderson. I believe you that are correct. Right. Yeah. yeah, and he and even and Frankenheimer said, "God, he was so good." And he goes, "He really did not make a lot of feature films. He was primarily a television actor." Mm -hmm. But that's the thing from top to bottom: MacGyver, Leslie Parrish. All these people are oh, yeah. so great. The guy who played the publisher, whose name currently escapes me, but Holden oh, Gaines. yeah, it's an yeah. excellent cast. Oh, Lloyd Corrigan is the actor. Okay, we, we, we got to talk about that scene where he kills the publisher, though. Yes, like he kills where, Holborn Gaines, where <laughs> he walks in and the guy is wearing like a frilly nightgown, and he's like, yeah. "Hey, don't get any ideas about this frilly nightgown I'm wearing in bed." My, it was my wife. wife. It's my wife's. <laughs> And, and then he's like, oh, I didn't know you had a wife. She died six years ago. It's like, <laughs> what? What? Like, what's what's happening in the scene? Like, I mean. It's, it's like just... the Janet Lee scene. <laughs> yeah, I know. Like, <laughs> so strange. They're just strange turns that, like, and, you know, in that Janet Lee scene, uh, um, you know, Frankenheimer says, oh, that's all from the novel. So it's not that we made up this crazy thing. It's all from the novel. And, the, the, you know, and, like, wh where... I don't know. Like, I there, I do think that some that those really idiosyncratic aspects of it, the things you can't quite pin down or make mm -hmm. perfect sense out of, are part of the appeal of this movie. Oh, it's like completely. part of the like, you know, like agree. you know, ra if it were, if it were, if those edges were smoothed off, and to some degree that happens in the the Jonathan Demi one, if those edges were smoothed yeah. off, it would, if it was more conventional, it probably wouldn't have the impact that it has or last the way that it did. Agreed. Yeah, I agree. 
And of course, uh, we talked about him when he passed Henry Silva as uh, uh, the Korean agent who then uh, becomes uh, Raymond Shaw's uh, houseboy. But right. uh, the the fantastic kung fu scene between uh, Sinatra yeah. and uh, and uh, Shaw and Silva is is fantastic, and especially when Frank goes into karate uh, stance and it's like, and they yeah the one the chop <laughs> that goes through the table, finger, right? yeah. yeah he broke yeah. his finger he broke his little finger mm -hmm. right yes that's the right. first martial yeah. arts fight in an American movie is uh, that's 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 we forget yeah. how brutal it is like you I I can mm -hmm. imagine in 1962. Were people used to seeing something? This, I mean, it starts with as soon as Sinatra sees Henry Silva, he punches him in the face, yeah, and he, yeah, he punches the camera, yes, yeah. And yeah. There's like moments where like Sinatra is like kicking Henry Silva like in the ribs, going yeah. like, What was Shaw doing with his hands? It's like yeah. he's not gonna talk to you, <laughs> and then the cops he fights the cops too when they come in, doesn't yes. he? Yes, punches out. <laughs> um, it yeah. is so great, I, I just love all that, and again. You know, I was college age, so when I saw this, it blew my mind. I'm like, mm -hmm. this is not this is not the Frank Sinatra from Ocean's Eleven, yeah, as right, we said. Right. It's such an unconventional, but he pulls it off. I mean, yeah. that's honestly, yeah. this is, I mean, this is around the time of the Red Grant fight, though, too, right? Like the uh, yes, from yeah. uh, uh, Russian with love, you know, Russian with love. Yeah, so, like you know, we uh, fights in uh, small areas, <laughs> brutal fights in yeah. uh, you know small spaces, were a thing. But but Sinatra really, I mean, and especially, I don't know how uh gen z per, per, perceives sinatra but it is easy they don't to know who he is i don't so think don't they know who yeah, he that's is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right who the hell am i kidding exactly but um it's he is so great and truly there are just a handful of movies this uh man with the golden arm suddenly um even Mary his Mary. his last serious role and i don't mean contract on cherry street which is an interesting tv movie that he made afterwards but uh the first deadly sin First Deadly Sin is a great low key Sinatra performance. He is he is really yeah, Faye Dunaway is dying. He's a cop near retirement, and uh, all of a sudden there's this psycho killer that he's got to track. And it is it is great. I, it, it was made in 1981, and uh, James uh, Whitmore is in the movie. Faye Dunaway again plays his wife. It's it's great, and he's just he's really he's really terrific in it. And 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 I remember Siskel even, you know, when uh, Manchurian Candidate came out, he he called back for his Deadly Sin, and and said, "There's another great, low key perform performance by Sinatra." I mean, I, I do. I, I, it's one of my favorites. It is my favorite Sinatra movie, Manchurian. Uh, yeah. I mean, he's yeah. Oh, definitely. I think so. Yeah. I mean, uh, the uh, and it's probably the most interesting movie. He's good in other yeah. stuff. There's other good movies, but um, sure. but like he. Uh, I mean, he's also just notorious for not being particularly easy to deal with. And, oh yeah, uh, I was going to so, say. like, you know, his the the whole thing about him, you know, like Frankenheimer, you know, frames it as well. You know, Frank was just it wasn't that Frank would only do one take; it was he was only good for one take, right? Oh, so, okay. <laughs> like, that's, so maybe, that's all a difference without a distinction. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so but those are two bullies. So yeah, I don't know how that. Well, imagine well I mean, he had to he somehow. I mean, I know that they had trouble together, and definitely Frank and I was a bully. I mean, he was the he, yeah. he was a, a a big character who you know was not so much about the nuance of your performance or anything like that. He was a you know like Angela Lansbury in their interview talks about him as really just like, and she loved him, but like, and they 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 made a movie together previous to this, All Fall Down, and that's how she ended up in this one. Yes, and um, but she talks about him as just being like this presence with a, an enormous amount of enthusiasm and like every still you see of him like for, on set it's like he's turned or he's like doing mm -hmm. something or pointing or something like he's he just a big like, guy wasn't he yeah he was, he was a tall big tall guy and like an imposing you know un difficult guy but and so uh frank sinatra not a big tall guy but the uh but like uh it does seem like those guys could i can't imagine those guys really getting along on set but they clearly got it done there's there are things in it where like as I was watching the movie this time I was like there mul there's it's very pointed in a scene towards the end but like there are multiple like singles on Sinatra that are out of focus in this movie yeah. right yes. and like uh, it and it's well it's just like and when I was watching it this time I was like man they they kept in these shots that were soft and then I was like oh he probably just did one take and that was what they got you know but like. Uh, you know, Frankenheimer t talks more at length about it later where, you know, where there, there's the deprogramming scene towards the end where yeah. he's, uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, 
where you know where where like the main close up on him is soft the entire time. But Frankenheimer says that they you know they uh, they shot it. It was the performance was so great. Next day comes back from the lab. You know, it's the the shot is soft. He goes to tell Frank. Frank cries about it. He he was so you know he was so happy with that performance. He didn't. They don't know if he could do it again. They bring him back. Frank has laryngitis. He can't he can't reshoot it. They try it another time. He just wasn't good enough the other time. So you know so against everybody, against the wishes of the editors and the producers, uh, uh, Frank Heimer's like we're putting it in. We're using that one right. And it's just like sure. Frank. whatever but like uh, but the, Print the uh, legend yeah exactly but you know it does kind of just seem like well the, the the one he was good in was the one who was out of focus but we're just gonna man, use it i don't i don't know if you guys remember but truly i remember in the theater it really it that moment holds our attention yeah. we're, we're right it's there a hell of a scene. And yeah, it, look, is, it, it is an amazing scene and it's the it's the class it's the i always bring up i don't know do you know, guys know who herschel gordon lewis is uh sure. right? yes. well, i know will does uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> gordon -Lewis, who directed, i got the box set <laughs> uh you know blood feast and the, the and a lot of these you know these first very gore oriented early 60s movies one time on a commentary uh you know, a track I was listening to. He and there's this terrible shot, like awkwardly panning somebody across the room. And on the commentary, he's like, "Nobody ever walked out of the theater over a ragged pan." And like, <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, you know, the, the, you know, you. So there's something, some technical deficiency in it. You know, the the performance is there. You're getting the, you know, the feeling of it. It's yeah. nobody's gonna care about that. Yeah, especially and by that point in the movie, you you're in. I mean, it's yeah. yeah. Because this is hit, you know, when Raymond, you know, when he thinks he broke all the chains and all the king's horses, and you know, you're rooting for Raymond, like he's free, he's free, yeah, and then yeah. and then you don't know you you when he goes, you don't know if he is free or not, you know, right? You and know so he so he's so destroyed. Yeah. So supposedly there in the novel, it's that he is pro like it, Frank's character takes that moment to kind of program yes. him to go kill. Angela Lansbury and uh, you know Iceland. And, uh, Iceland and the um, and like, but they felt like they couldn't do that. They felt like it would undermine our sympathies for the Frank character. I'm not entirely sure. Yeah. I kind of get it, but it's another one of the kind of interesting ambiguities of this because you just don't know for sure in a way mm -hmm. whether he yeah. was deprogrammed and he's you don't doing know until this. He pulls that trigger if he's yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it's and in the movie they more established that they don't know what the plan is. Yes, yeah, they don't know. He's only supposed to know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, but I don't know. I mean, do you guys feel like he is still programmed to do that, and he follows through the thing, or is it that he is making the choice to do this? I'm, no, I, I think that it's a little ambiguous. Yeah. Yeah, it, it is. It is ambiguous. Yeah. What I love about it, and what I feel is, is. Um, as deep as his uh, brainwashing programming is, his hatred of his mother is deeper. Yes. And that's yes. what yeah. takes over. Yes. Yes. Um, that is why this is talking just about the idiosyncrasies of this movie. This is a movie where the uh, happy ending or happy ending or the, the cheer moment is a man uh, shooting his mother and stepfather. Yes. Right. In front of the world, in front yes. of the camera. Yes. And, and then killing himself. Yeah, that's yeah. Randy. moment. Yeah, and she while holding his medal of honor, the moment when he, after he shoots uh, the senator, and you get that great shot of Angela Lansbury, knowing what's she knows all of a sudden what's coming next. And yeah, for the only time in the whole movie, she is scared. And as John was saying, it's fucking brutal. Like oh, he, yeah. they, he, there is some little squib that goes off in the center of his head, or just, or maybe it's just a cut to him. But it's like. You know, he's shot in the temple or yeah. Yeah. whatever this yeah. one is. That may not be the temple, but the uh, the you know uh, <laughs> yeah right and, uh, right between the eyes. And, is right, yeah, exactly. And you know, and it it has a huge impact. And then it's a wider shot for uh, for the Angela Lansbury character. Yes. But just the way she just her physical movement carrying yeah. this idea of her being shot is so it it really takes you aback. It's very brutal. And mm -hmm. honestly, that's why I believe the sensitivity of a president being assassinated, I think did oh, play I a think, role. I think everybody thinks that played a role. I think it's just that the, that the, okay, John, you're right. Well, they didn't. My I, the, I mean, it's, it's just that the, that I, what Ian was saying about, about it being 
the mid seventies by the time anybody was making those yeah, real but, choices. I think that 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 it was probably multiple. Gabe, I, all I know is when the Zapruder film finally came to light in the seventies. That was the seventies. It still yeah. Yeah. shocked yeah. people. Yeah, and and yeah. that even though this is make believe, it is so raw that I mean, dude, I watched that Geraldo Rivera. Uh, presentation of the Zapruder tape in the 70s and it was fucking scary and this even though this is i'm not not, but and i'm just saying about something i'm not arguing but but my point is that the 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 fakeness or the hollywood presentation of this kind of assassination i can't think of a comparable scene up to that point Oh no! It had no, that I kind of brutality. So. I mean, and that's I mean, why I think maybe it did play a small role in. It didn't do well, and this is gross. Oh yeah, no, I think all of those things. Oh, were I think it was in why it was cold. Yeah, the violence, regardless of whether it was happening in in the world or not, I do think the violence probably turned people off at the time. Probably, yeah. But, probably. Yeah. Well, and um, also, my God, even the very end. I mean, it's just it is so antithetical to Hollywood happy endings. Yeah. Because yeah, that all that happens, and then Frank does his whole speech about Raymond, his epitaph, and mm-hmm. and is just is overwhelmed with emotion at the end. Yeah, that's how it hell. ends with the yeah. rain falling, and yeah, what's he say? Hell, hell, or oh, yeah, hell. something or yeah, that's what got oh, yeah. Although yeah. I gotta say, I my 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 pick for you know the greatest moment in uh, in Frank Sinatra's acting career is uh, when. There's a scene like where, you know, when everything's starting to come together, he's going to race over there to Lawrence Harvey. Uh, and uh, the, and a couple of guys look up at the TV and they're like, uh, uh, they're like, uh, uh, oh, they they handed the nomination to that idiot Iceland or whatever. And then Frank goes, oh, and he walks out the door. Like <laughs> that moment where it's just like, and on top of everything, this. <laughs> yeah, <they're> calling <laughs> Iceland and it, everybody knows he's an idiot. Right. Yes. Everybody exactly. said that. It, yeah. it's like known, but he's still. I mean, that's a lesson that yeah, luckily hard. Everyone yeah. knows he's an idiot, yet he rises to power anyway. Yes. Oh, and okay. So it's a that. it's a documentary. I forgot. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, the, um, the, I take back everything I said before. Uh, the, uh. Um, uh, but uh, I just want to say, like, I read the New York Times review of this from yeah. Bosley Crowther uh, oh, at the Times. Please. Right. Yeah. And uh, and like his big point about he didn't give it a great review. The big point he made was kind of that it, there, there was, you know, he had praise for everybody who's in it. He had praise for Frankenheimer and for the style of it and all that. But basically said that it didn't really have anything on its mind. But at the same time uh, said, which seems a little ridiculous in retrospect, yeah. <laughs> but the, but uh, but at the same time, he did make a big point all through it that people are so worked up about politics right now that they probably just don't want to see this, you know, and uh, like because of the Cuban Missile Crisis, you mm-hmm. know, thing and because, you know, people were so concerned about all of that stuff. I, I just thought it was interesting that that was like as much what he was writing about as the film itself. Um, yeah. So I guess that kind of played into the, the box office failure, too. Um, just that general sentiment. Sure. Um, I, uh, I, oh, please continue, Gabe. No, go ahead. go ahead. I was going to say, uh, you know, again, uh, pointing out just Angela Lansbury uh, before and after uh, this movie. Um, another great performance that, and it's a small role, but I love her in uh, The Court Jester, the Nanny Kay movie hmm. from the early 50s, where she is uh, the princess in that movie. Uh, the love interest is uh, Glenn's John, but uh, she's she's great in that. And I just wanted to show, because really, uh, this is how lovely Angela Lansbury was yeah. in her in her youth, and and yeah, just a great, just an amazing actress, and so and, many. And real fast, I was just going to say that during that period of murder, she wrote, she was one of those great, and and uh, this was a, um, this is a common practice, but she gave so many older actors the opportunity to act in murder. She wrote mm-hmm. to help them secure their Screen Actors Guild health insurance, and she was a big proponent of that. Her son. Wasn't her son like a Manson acolyte? Or I think it was the daughter. daughter. Yeah. Okay, daughter. excuse me. That's why they. But, and the son was a drug addict. Pardon me. But both troubled kids, and you know she she really obviously was a good mom and really got them out of their problems and they're still alive today and have adjusted since those those wayward years and it's and again that's was, a great testament to her. She was she was what three years older than Lawrence Harvey? Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, oh, really. Yeah. 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 Very, yeah, there was no age difference. No, and no, she's got that. Yeah, 
the great scene where she finally reveals the plan when oh, she's yeah. talking to him and she she goes oh. on and on about like you know what they're going to do and how they're going to make martial law look like anarchy mm-hmm. and then, and she says like and then I'll get them back for what they've done to you and for a moment you think maybe she cares about him but then she says and what they've done in underestimating me and it becomes yeah. all clear it's as all about to what her. really yeah. pissed her and off then <laughs> She leans in and yes, kisses her does. son on the mouth, re- yeah. like in a for very a pointed yeah. way for a long time. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I mean, it's this movie is weird, yeah. right? In I the, mean, it's, in, in the film, it's in ambiguous yeah. what the relationship is. In the novel, it is not ambiguous. Oh, oh well, I don't. Ambiguous. Yeah, well, okay. But and that, and that I love sense. I love when Sinatra talks about it on the you know in that little bonus featurette. Oh yeah, well the kiss. I mean that uh, that said everything. I mean he he needed the jack at that moment to even get through talking about it and stuff. But I mean you see the smirk on his face. But isn't it interesting? This is like uh, the Godfather novel compared to the film in that yeah. the novels are smuttier. Oh, the than we got in, in the films. Yeah, but I read the Godfather years after seeing the movie, and there's whole chapters devoted not only to Sonny's genitalia. Yes. To his wife's genitalia. Yes, and getting an operation yes. and like, oh my god, yeah. Like, what uh, is but... happening? <laughs> what? Yeah, in the in the Manchurian Candidate novel, uh, if you want to know what age uh, Raymond Shaw's mother started growing breasts, uh, you'll find out in this novel. <laughs> so go check it out. Well, you know, guys, this was the era of those, and I don't believe that um, Manchurian con- Candidate was serialized in Men's Adventure magazines the no. way that Godfather mm-hmm. was prior to it being released as a novel. I mean, this is that era of, of smutty... Pot boilers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. Yeah, pot, yeah. yeah, there you go. Yeah. You know, this is why I love Howard Chaykin because Howard's like, hey, I like smut, all right? I, I'm not ashamed of it. I grew up, I grew up reading this crap, and I, and I like it. And it's like, I hear you, Howard, all right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't. I don't have anything against smut, John. I like smut fine. Uh, the, uh, I'd like to go on and talk about the um, uh, Father Hardman. Uh, I just want to talk about the um, uh, the people who worked on it, like some crew people who worked on it and stuff. Uh, I yeah. mean, the uh, the production designer, and this is Richard Silbert, and he went. He was basically, you know, an enormously influential uh, production designer. He, uh, you know, had an amazing career, particularly after this, into mm-hmm. the new Hollywood stuff. He's not really somebody who's known for, you know, as like, you know, a big stylist, although much later he did design uh, Dick Tracy because he worked with Warren Beatty on all those movies. Wow. But like, uh, but, you know, he he designed Chinatown and Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf and The Pawn Broker and Reds and Shampoo and Rosemary's Baby. And like he is he was kind of the production designer mm-hmm. of that era and did more than just, you know, what you normally think of as a production designer. Uh, he, he was very you know, he was just like a really influential figure from that time. So it's interesting that he, you know, that this is one of his, his earlier credits. Um, the, the, the thing, the photography in this movie, okay. Like everybody talks about it and it does have a lot of, you know, stylized elements to it. But I also think that, um, you know, uh, Lionel Linden, the, the DP lets it down a little bit. Like, I think that there's a kind of, maybe like a little bit more prosaic quality to, you know, to some of it and some of it's more stylized. I, I just think, I don't think it's bad, but I think that the, that this particular Frankenheimer ish look, uh, you know, was like seconds is where that really works. Like where all okay, of those sure. things work together. Cause sure. the J- James Wong Howe was one of the greatest cinematographers in okay. the history of movies. And he shot seconds and like, he was able to take that kind of, highly stylized big wide angle lenses all that sort of shit and meld it with the more kind of semi-documentary stuff and i think in a way that kind of is the perfect version of that but uh, i mean it's all those elements are still here but i but i think there's that that has a slightly more conventional look that doesn't doesn't work uh, in this retrospect after watching the other movies around it like it doesn't work for me quite as well as, as like seconds would and i think that this movie would be improved if james, james wong Howe had shot it but uh you know but I, I and linden didn't have a lot of other you know he shot a lot of tv he didn't really have a lot of other distinguished credits but um clearly frankenheimer liked him he worked with him multiple times so that's you know he's one of his guys but uh but i just 
I, I think that it, it doesn't work quite as well. Well, but, wanna... but and I totally hear what you're saying, but those moments are strong. The moments are incredibly strong and, when and they really, you know, when they get that, to it. Yeah. As we said earlier, and I, I want to get back to the, the image of it, but um that combination of film and television was hard to do. And I know in Frankenheimer's uh, oral history interview that he gave to the American Television Academy, he talked about it. And God, I mean, this is just when when uh, James Gregory is speaking, but the guy that he accuses of being a communist and the way the camera immediately like swings mm -hmm. to it and just yeah. all these images playing out on a television screen, all that's effective. It's very and, effective. And, and, yeah. and would you say that the turntable of the uh, of the uh, communists and uh, the flower show and that combination and stuff yeah would I, you give that more to the production designer rather no, 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 i think i think it's all it's it's well it's everybody because you can only shoot what's on the set but the uh, but like the um but i do think that the the kind of flatness of the lighting is maybe just not is not as attractive to me as as like you know the somewhat contrastier stuff that james wong had did but the sure. um but like uh i i mean pretty subjective stuff not really a big deal but the um but like uh i i think that the oh fuck i had a thought i but i lost it so, well we should no, mention I, uh two people were nominated even though the film did not do well this film got two academy nomination one is angela lansbury for best mm -hmm. supporting actress i guess there is even though I, I would say she's lead actress if there's a lead actress in this film but yeah whatever yeah. uh the other person to get uh Nomination is uh, Ferris Webster, who's the editor. Mm. Uh, who, Makes sense. Uh, yeah. yeah. The the like I said, you know, I didn't have to like when I watched this when I was like 15 years old, I didn't have to um, adjust my mind to the older rhythms of a of a movie like this. Uh, feels just as pace, just as uh, mm -hmm. vi vitally as a yeah. as a normal fuck normal film, modern uh, film. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I agree with that. Oh, the one thing I was going to say is that this, you know, this thing about using the, you know, uh, using the TV image within the, you know, the image and all that, like yeah. this was, this was what he did on the comedian on live television yeah. and, uh, you know, and like, but he didn't have to technically innovate to do that. I mean, you were shooting, you know, on, on video and shooting video and, you know, and, but the, when, you know, when they went to film and he wants to do this on film, Film is 24 frames per second. Video is 29.9. Like they have, you know, and so they didn't sync. So when people were, you know, uh, and it, it was, I think, it, you know, it was later when they figured out ways to kind of slave the, uh, or if I'm supposed to say that still, uh, the um, the the camera to the to the video in, to keep the roll bar, you know, the the you know the the rolling bars out of it. Yeah. But you know, and they yes. said, you know, and he he said, oh, the the. You know, people said, oh, technically, you're not going to be able to do that. They're going to be bars rolling across it, blah, blah, blah. And he was like, fuck it. So they're bars rolling across it. Who cares? Blah, blah, yeah, that makes In that it John Frankenheimer cool. sort of way, you know. Right. Yeah. It's it great, it, though. It actually makes it look cooler. Yeah, you it know? Does. And reality. It, it yeah. had that high, it, mm -hmm. had, it yeah. gave it a heightened sense of reality. Yeah. Um, all right. More, more Leslie Parrish, of course, as we mentioned. Uh, she's in that great Star Trek episode with Apollo. Uh, <laughs> Mike, okay. Michael Forrest, right? That's his name? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it is. Yeah. And, uh, and of course, she is. Uh, with uh, the Eli Wallach, Mister Freeze, and uh, yeah, she's great. No, I uh, again staple of uh, of uh, a lot of uh, you know telev sixties television TV. Yeah, yeah. So no, she's terrific, and uh, yeah, I and 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 that's why again she humanizes uh, Raymond in, in her in her love of him, and uh, yeah, they they play off each other so well, and that's pretty cool. And she's really, really good in the movie. She gives a great performance in the movie. Absolutely, and so tragic. Absolutely. So and, yeah. yeah, and the, her the way that her you know for all of my whining about stuff the way that her that scene uh, where she's killed is shot is hyper stylized but yeah. so effective that she's framed through the door off in the distance something more impactful to it because mm -hmm. we see her whole figure and her falling and all of that like well I don't and, know. and and that his in that moment he is detached from. The love of yeah. his life. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. yeah. Just oh, content wise, yeah. it's so tragic. Yes. Absolutely. absolutely. And it yeah. follows the scene where MacGyver's holding the milk and he gets shot and then the milk yes. comes out of it. Yes. There. Which is a, gr a great stylized thing that I feel like everybody in stole after this. Yeah, you know? exactly. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff that, that you know, even just the Manchurian Canada idea that people saw, but also like, okay, in the end, uh, Lawrence Harvey 
when he is going to assassinate, he is dressed as a priest. There doesn't seem to be any reason, except I guess people wouldn't suspect a priest. Yeah, so he, yeah. he has guess, somewhat yeah. free yeah. access. Even though he's a celebrity, he's known person, they would be like, why is the senator's stepson dressed like a priest? Whatever. Yes. Just that him, part is a little bit puzzling. Him dressed as a priest with the hat, but also the gun, like, is so menacing. It looks that you've seen people uh, do that look. Yes. Again. Yeah. And um, that and kind of. Like, uh, so, and him in a doorway. It's like. Oh, yeah. Making yeah. some sort of ironic counterpoint between yeah. the person who, you know, what they're wearing and that they're an what assassin they and everything. What? And there is some movie that's in my head that I can't quite bring up. There is a machine else. gun priest with Gerald. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Or, yeah that's you know. <laughs> Why yeah. did they have to have him win the Medal of Honor? They make such a big deal about it, but then. I, so that's you know, part of what I'm it, saying. It, Why did we have to have the voiceover telling us all about the Medal yeah. of Honor and everything when they? I mean, it's fine no that he does, but, well, because you know? it, it it establishes his cover. Yeah, no sure. one's yeah. Yeah. them. They right. Right. And, and, you get know, access yeah. anywhere. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay, he he it. would get access anywhere basically. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That he wasn't yeah. just. A Korean War vet, but he was this. And he also should wear the medal in every scene. So yes. he could wear so, medal so, honor, so, medal yeah, honor. Yeah, look, yeah. <laughs> he <laughs> had it in the in the assassination. I mean, he breaks it out, so he yeah, can, right. yeah, he, he, he puts it on. Oh, yeah. like, yeah. that out. Very well, and it also story. and it also helps uh, Senator Iceland because that's the. I mean, yeah, the way right, they frame his welcome home is. Hey, the senator's war hero son is home. Yeah, that's right. And then at the end, movie wise, it gives. You know, it allows Sinatra to do the thing tying him to the other Medal of Honor winner. This is yeah, this right. was his that's real true. heroic that's moment. Yeah, Absolutely, that's and that's a nice moment at the end. Yeah, yeah, great um, fucking. I, I will say there is, like... there is a big flaw in the communist plan, whereas uh, the presidential candidate chooses uh, James Gregory as vice president of the convention. Uh, that's one element of the Jonathan Demme remake that doesn't hold up because they don't really choose vice president at the convention anymore. Yeah, it's right. kind of chosen beforehand. Yeah. That that sort of sixty two was like the last time you could do something like this. If the 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 idea is that when the presidential candidate, who I believe is called like Arthur or something, uh, yeah. when he's killed, James Gregory will take over. But right. That actually isn't how things work when it, when it, they're still candidates. Well, the, the the party yeah. can still choose a different candidate. But I, to be fair to the movie, I think that the point they, they make were me, making was that he would like he would look so yeah, he, they yeah. have a situation where he looks so heroic and so in exactly. charge that there would be, exactly. it would be sort of undeniable that he would. Right. What if he tripped over his words? He's a big dummy. Yeah. We've still well, the blood. Yeah, okay, if it's, it's been worked on for eight years, yeah, if, if, yeah, oh, that's yeah true. Worked if, on approximately if, 57 bullets. Yeah, he's gonna remember the hopefully the <laughs> speech has to do with ketchup bottles. Yeah, ketchup I mean, may, maybe the, the big flaw in their plan was they picked a fucking idiot to be right, their, right, to be their dupe. But well, let's just think through how that works in real life, yeah, and it's, how, it's a pretty good plan. Uh, I, I think that you can be a at least former communist power and buy off someone who then becomes the president of the United States, <laughs> and uh, that's how it all works. So, we, we have nothing to criticize. <laughs> and of course, uh, later on in uh, Beneath the Planet of the Apes, he has his excellent uh, speech. The only good human is a dead human. Yeah. Yep. He, I mean, I grew up with him as Inspector Luger, so it was a pleasure to see him. Oh, yes, of course. Oh, as well. yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. I love that. Yeah, Barney. Yeah. yeah. And then John, and Barney, you, let's go is, in your office. You got to go into your Barney Miller chunk now. Somebody, uh, <laughs> somebody brought it up. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Tom Fowler's son isn't here to. Uh, no. uh, oh, uh, I don't care. But yeah. uh, you. <laughs> um, I, I think we all should. All-time favorite TV show, Barney Miller. Oh, it's a great uh, show. I was just rewatching it. Uh, the um, uh, we should mention George Axelrod, who co-produced this movie. I'm so and, glad you uh, did, because you know, I meant uh, to say it earlier. Absolutely, and, and did the and wrote the screenplay. And you know he like he wrote Seven Year Itch. He uh, um, and he he wrote uh, that uh, the the live TV episode that we covered, the uh, Confessions of a Nervous Man with Art yes. Barney. Uh, you know, then Will Successful Rock, uh, Rock, Hunter, Rock Hunter, How to Mur Murder Your Wife, like a lot of yeah. stuff. Also, yeah. more comedic of a, a you know of a yes. guy. Yeah. So that's part of this weird tone that we're dealing with. He wants to check out a movie. Oh, go ahead, Will. 
It's, did he do Lord Love a Duck? Or I was going to say, people should check out Lord Love a Duck. That's it's a, a crazy movie he movie. wrote and directed yeah. in 66, starring Roddy McDowell in Tuesday Weld. Uh, oh. It is insane. It in is fact, here, insane. Here, here's, if you take not, folks, anyone listening to the sound of my voice, if you take nothing away from this, please do yourself a favor and do this Roddy McDowell double feature. Roddy McDowell high school movie double feature. Of Lord Love a Duck and Pretty Maids All in a Row. Oh my God! Two no, movies. Wait, hold on. We're we'll recommending people watch Gene Roddenberry's Pretty Maids All in a Row. Sure, technically, know. it's Roger. Turtle, Rodney. Kojak. Okay, sure. Rock Hudson, Both Asian. movies have Roddy McDowell in, in very different roles. They're about uh, old people's insane view of teenagers. Yeah. Uh, watch both those movies. You'll you'll go to prison afterwards. Yes. You'll be yeah. driven insane. <laughs> But you should watch both of those. Lord Love yeah. a Duck has a scene where Tuesday Wald is trying on different sweaters in front of her father that is one of the most insane scenes in movie history. It yeah. is never and seen. And then it. Pretty Maids All in a Row is like a movie of just that scene. It yeah, that worked. scene stretched yeah. out. Okay. <laughs> that, well, man, you want to lose respect for Gene yeah. Roddenberry? Pretty Maids All in a Row. But Good it has Lord. Kojak before Kojak. Yeah, yes. he probably got Kojak because of this movie. I think he probably so got other cool. things because but, of this movie, too. The skeeziest uh, Rock Hudson performance. Gene Roddenberry was interested in some things that weren't Star Trek, okay? (laughs) And they Uh, were all in that movie. I'd like to suggest a scene where William Shatner is uh, bathing a a 12-year-old girl. Is that uh, possible? Uh, Mr. Roddenberry, (laughs) no, no. Yeah, okay. No, it's never that gross, but Um, it's not that gross. But, uh, yeah, so we will not be covering those two movies. Probably. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, <laughs> now I think we're all together pretty much all in a row. Hilarious. Oh, my but God. But Ian and I will on our new podcast. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, we're, we're doing the Roger Vadim podcast. Oh, God, yeah. Vadimiets is what it's called. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we're getting it's in a... just before the remake of Barbarella is coming out. That's okay. right. They're well, doing that. best of luck to you guys. <laughs> I love it. Um, yeah, we're gonna have to uh, decide what uh, our next film will be. It doesn't necessarily have we, to. We be don't to get to decide. We don't get to decide. Oh, God, God decides for us. God yeah. decides for yes. us. Yeah. Like, yeah. Who's gonna die? That's who's, that's, who's that's, that's claim Grim next. Reaper that's decides. Yes. <laughs> well, I, I don't know. I guess we'll have to. You know, when poor Leslie Parrish uh, leaves the mortal coil. Oh, don't. Uh, we'll have no, to uh, no. revisit. There are other people in the world who are still living who ha- were in movies from at least sixty or seventy years ago. For the for the word of the audience that is Not watching many. but also listens to the podcast, uh, thank God I've got my regular computer back, and uh, likely tomorrow I will release a great interview that I did of a, an actor who is contemporary to this period, and that's Gary Conway, uh, oh, who yeah. made I Was a Teenage Frankenstein and How to Make uh, a Monster, and yeah. later was on Burke's Law, the Aaron Spelling Show with Gene Barry, mm-hmm. and then finally his great role of, of Two and a Half Seasons doing um, uh, Land of the Giants, and he was the captain on that Irwin Allen sci-fi show. Uh, it was a pleasure talking to him. And I really, if you like this kind of discussion, uh, you will be thrilled with Gary's observations about this period of Hollywood and how the studio system was crumbling and how independent film was taking over and mm-hmm. the focus of the studios to television. He was a contract Warner Brothers player in the early 60s doing all the Westerns and uh, police procedurals of the day before going on Burke's Law and then Land of the Giants and also made some interesting independent films in the 70s as well. Really fascinating career. So great of a conversation that I'm like, we didn't cover everything that I want to cover. And God bless him for uh, putting up with my nonsense and be like, oh, let's do it again. Let's let's talk in a couple of weeks and, and get more of what you want. So I'm thrilled. So that's all I'm audio sure. only. John, uh, I'm I'm looking forward to this. Uh, he is a fascinating guy. Did you talk about? So he has kind of like two careers. He eventually became a writer, and he wrote for a studio I'm fascinated by. He wrote for Canon. Yes, he uh, did. He wrote uh, American, the American two of the American Ninja movies and Over the Top. Yep. Uh, to, to, uh, by the way, uh, you know, like, in Monaco. Yeah. we were going, we were going chronologically. Okay. So, and that's my point. Cause I'm like, Gary, uh, cause I, you know, the man, first of all, the man's 85, mm-hmm. but razor sharp, razor yeah. sharp. And so, and, and full voice. I mean, I, th- I felt like I was talking to 1968 Gary uh, Conway. It was amazing. But I'm like, you know, again, I'm like, please, can we continue? 
because he did have such an interesting career. So we allude to his 70 films. We didn't talk about the canon films, but we absolutely will. And that's why I'm like, you got to come back. And also now, first of all, married to the same woman uh, since 1957. She was in 1957 wow. Miss America, which is Whoa. wow. And and the two of them could have stood on their own uh, wedding cake. They're that pretty. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and also... Um, they ultimately bought this land, not in Napa Valley, but Northern California. And they uh, started it as a ranch and a farm, eventually became a vineyard, and it's still a vineyard now. Yes. And, and yeah, he's a successful, uh, you know, winemaker. And, and Interesting. he was in China five years ago talking to wine people, but he's like, don't kid yourself. Uh, land of the Giants is still very popular in China. That's why they wanted me to come, <laughs> which is great. And actually, even this weekend, as we're recording this, He's going to be at a, a convention in Burbank. I don't know if it's a horror. I'm assuming it's a horror convention. And, you know, we ran the Fantastic Four commercial. The reason why I ended up talking to him was Alex Ross chose 60s Gary Conway as his Reed Richards for really? the new Fantastic Four graphic novel and contacted him through his people and said, you know, hey, I'd like to use, you know, uh, Gary's yeah. likeness if it's OK. And Gary was so thrilled. And I even said, I'm like, Gary, this is your Marvel movie. I'm like this 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 graphic novel, and he goes, "Hey, believe me, I don't have to sit in a trailer and wait." He goes, "You know, I was just used my likeness, and it was fantastic." So no, he's he's delighted that he's Mister Fantastic, no, and cool. Deanna Lund, his co-star from Land of the Giants, is uh, Alex's Sue Storm. So pretty cool. So that's coming Great. up. Yeah, sorry, long diatribe, but no, I figured it was kind of cool. Yeah. Our era. All right. Well, there you go, everybody. I'm really glad that we had this chance. Uh, we will see what the fates uh, decide. Yeah, just, the, at our what, next the, what the death watch decides. That's right. <laughs> we should point out that we did taking of Pelham one, two, three without anyone passing. So because uh, everyone yeah, from the movie's right. already no Hector Elizondo. Right. Hector Elizondo yeah. still around. Yeah. yeah, we basically just hadn't found our format yet at that point. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> so join us for the next death cinema. Uh, coming soon to another episode. We, we celebrate Wars. their lives. Of course we do. Sure. Whatever. Uh, yeah. yeah. You know. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot. Uh, join us next time and really appreciate you guys that were watching. Take care. Uh, be safe. Be happy. Be healthy. Mm -hmm.